So now we come to the very interesting question of the particular health hazards to infants, that is children aged zero to six months. And this issue was raised by, by my then wife, Angela, who was a trained registered nurse. And she pointed out that often young children are the most sensitive to chemicals and of course to ionizing radiation. So I had a look at the literature, uh, the official literature on recommended fluoride intakes for infants. And I discovered that the main recommendations were published in one of the leading American journals called Pediatrics. And the authors of that study had calculated a kind of what they called was an average fluoride intake for infants based on very questionable means. They used a market bar I started again. they used a market basket method for estimating the fluoride intake that infants normally received. The problem is that many infants don't eat much solid food in the first six months mm -hmm. after birth, and so that's, that was a very dubious approach. And then in terms of infants who drank formula, uh, breast milk formula, uh, formula as a substitute for breast milk, they only considered formula that was already made up or already in liquid form. So it occurred to Angela and me that uh, they may not have adequately considered formula that is purchased in a powder form and then fluoridated water is added to it. So there was some investigation of the fluoride content of the powdered formula, but they didn't seem to have taken into account the fluoride in the drinking water that was added to the formula. And my wife pointed out that we can calculate this very well because there are very strong dietary guidelines for water intake by infants. And the typical guideline is 150 millilitres of water per kilogram of body weight. And that's standard in many countries. And we then went back and looked at the papers in paediatrics and found that where they did consider uh, infant formula, they they had the wrong intake of water. Now that seems incredible because 150 millilitres per kilogram of body weight is a standard amount that is, you know, checked at baby health centres and so on. Uh, but they had not realised, uh, living in some sort of academic uh, silo, they had not realised this was a requirement. And then if you have fluoride at one part per million in drinking water and a six month old child weighs eight kilogram, they would be taking in eight times 150 milligrams per day, which is over a gram of fluoride a day. Now this is a very high dose for an infant. It is several times the, the dose level that was recommended at that time back in the 1990s for infants, and I should add in parenthesis that there's no evidence that taking in fluoride by infants has any benefit for teeth. For teeth. It's just part of the propaganda, but there's no scientific evidence. But anyway, so we found that infants were taking in one gram up to one and a half grams of fluoride per day, while I believe now the official uh, guideline is something like 0 0.01 grams per day. So they were taking in very high doses compared to that official guideline. So we decided to try and make, get some corrections made in the journal Pediatrics, where the original uh, incorrect data was published. And this goes out to all doctors and so on. So because we thought writing a peer-reviewed paper would be quite difficult to get published. We just wrote a letter to the editor. We thought we would have a reasonable chance of publishing that. So we sent off a letter making these main points that there'd been previous studies published in paediatrics had uh, underestimated the fluoride intake of intake of the fluoride intake of infants uh, who 
have powdered milk formula made up with fluoridated water. And the editor wrote back initially that they were very busy and they had a lot of editors and there wasn't enough space and that rather irritated me so I wrote back and pointed out that we were going to publicize this one way or another and it's the failure of the journal to publish the correct figures could lead to legal action by parents of children who'd been overdosed with fluoride. Now that really galvanized the editor into action but unfortunately not into the action of publishing our, um, our little letter. Uh, instead he sent the letter out to three referees, two of whom were associated with the early incorrect uh, material published in paediatrics and other journals and the third was an anonymous referee. And of course, unsurprisingly, the referees wrote back uh, not encouraging publication of our letter, but the interesting thing was they couldn't contradict our main points. So they, they basically accepted them, but they tried to weasel out of it in various ways. So they said, oh, well, in the fine print of our papers, we do say that there could be higher intakes than the level we uh, calculated incorrectly. Um, but it was all in fine print, and our concern was that misleading information had been circulated to the medical profession uh, to paediatricians and so on. And, um, but the also the other interesting thing was that one of the responses by one of the authors who had written the incorrect material originally was that he actually admitted that publishing our letter could encourage the anti-fluoridation movement. Now this was a totally Im improper response because our letter did not challenge fluoridation. It simply wanted to, to make the taking of infant formula safer for young children. And it should have been judged on its own merits. But here they were saying that, uh, that it might encourage the anti-fluoridation movement. The other response we tended to get was that they felt very threatened their status was being threatened because they had made errors and they had published misleading material and they were unwilling to, to correct it. So we had no joy with paediatrics, so we said, well, we'll try and send it to another medical journal. And one medical journal that had previously published material uh, which could be interpreted as questioning fluoridation was the New Zealand Journal of Medicine. So we sent our letter there, but the editor rejected that. He said, well, that may be of interest to Americans, but why is it of interest to New Zealanders? Although, of course, the issue applies in New Zealand and Australia and the United States and everywhere where fluoridated water is prevalent. So that stymied us for a while, but in the end, uh, we wrote a full paper and sent it to a journal called Accountability in Research. So we framed it as here, are, here is a, an establishment uh, rejecting solid scientific material because it may um, threaten fluoridation which they are supporting and it may threaten their status. And we, within our journal paper, we included the whole letter that we had sent to paediatrics and we also quoted extensively from the referees reports which were so revealing. So eventually uh, our paper was published in accountability and research, at least it got out into the scholarly literature, but of course I doubt that any paediatrician or medical doctor would read accountability and research. And I guess we were also disappointed that although we circulated our, uh, this material widely to the anti-fluoridation movement, very few of them seemed to see the significance at the time, back in the 1990s. And it's only been fairly recently uh, 
that it has become an issue in the United States and that our earlier work has been rediscovered, so to speak, and is now being addressed much more vigorously. But my impression is in the United States where it has become an issue and people are arguing against fluoridation of cities partly on the grounds of the risk to infants, that the fluoridation establishment has, which had actually issued some modest warnings about powdered inf infant formula uh, and about re reconstituting it with fluoridated water, they have now backed off and withdrawn their warnings and hidden their warnings, presumably because they feel it might encourage the anti-fluoridation movement. And this is a very, very poor uh, approach to science and public policy.